Hi. This is the key step 37. An evolution of the very popular original key step 32. And aside from five additional keys on the bottom octave, its most notable new features are four additional control knobs for CC controls and extended chord features, scales, keyboard LEDs that help you see what's playing and give you feedback on a number of settings, a display to show you the tempo and other information, and quite a few randomization and generative tools. In this video, I'll go over everything, talk about a few generative and performance ideas and tips, more of this gem at the end of this video, Let's get started. Let's start with an overview of Keystep 37. Regardless of its new features, what makes it and the Keystep 32 stand out compared to most other MIDI controllers is that they have a built-in sequencer and arpeggiator. So while you can use them with a computer, unlike most other controllers, you can also use them with standalone MIDI devices or control voltage-based hardware. The keys on Keystep 37 are mini or slim keys. They're both velocity sensitive with aftertouch. It has pitch, bend, and mod wheel strips. I'll talk about their pros and cons at the end of this video. Keystep 37 can be either in arpeggiator or sequencer mode. The arpeggiator has eight playback order modes and the sequencer has eight memory slots, each with up to 64 steps and can be either monophonic or polyphonic with up to eight simultaneous notes. Both the arpeggiator and sequencer support relative time divisions and rate or tempo controls, including fine-tuned tempo controls using shift, as well as a tap tempo feature. The new knobs on Keystep 37 compared to Keystep 32 have two main functions. The first is to send MIDI control change values, and these are between 0 and 127, and you've got four banks of four of these knobs, which you can swap through using the shift key. A white bank, blue, purple, and green. So you can control up to 16 parameters on external gear or on a computer with them. And aside from that, these knobs are also used to control chord mode, namely the chord type, the number of notes in a chord, the velocity to note ratio, which we'll cover, as well as strum, which we will cover too. Continuing on with the tour, you'll see these blue labels above the keys and under most of the buttons. You access them by holding shift. So if I wanted to change CC bank, I would just tap here. If I wanted to change my gate length, I would tap here, add swing, tap here, and so forth. The key step supports scales. That means that every note that's played, either on the keypad, on the arpeggiator, or sequencer, passes through a scale quantizer or filter. Again, using the labels, the default is chromatic, so it goes up by semitones, but if I, say, put it in the major scale, even though I play semitones, I'll get keys in a major scale, same goes for minor, and a blues scale. And you can also customize a user scale. You do that by hitting user, and if you hold this key, you can control which notes participate in the scale or not. So here they're all on, and I can turn off certain notes it's a little bit hard to do, but let's say turn off all the black keys and maybe just these notes. And now key step will snap any notes out of the scale to the scale. While we're on this topic, if you choose any other scale and hold it, you can choose the root note of the scale this way. Aside from parameters you can access directly on the control panel, you also have additional settings in the companion MIDI Control Center software, and you can also back up your settings and patterns there too. From a connectivity perspective, the Keystep 37 is identical to the Keystep 32, except that it has a USB type B jack instead of a micro USB jack, which is a welcome change. So both of them have five pin MIDI in and out ports, sync in and out for modular or other gear that accepts sync via CV, three CV outputs for pitch, gate, 
and modulation. And it also has a sustain pedal input. It will detect the polarity of the pedal if the pedal is plugged in when you turn the key step on. While we're talking about connectivity and the back panel, the dip switches let you choose the clock source for the key step, whether internal or one of the external sync options, whether external clock, MIDI, or USB. So a word about how I have this set up from a CV perspective, I've got pitch going in to control Brenzo here, which is a uh, complex oscillator, interesting one. Then that's fed into Desmodus Versio, which is a reverb. And I've got the mod strip controlling the size parameter here, so. That does that. Then I've got gate going in through a mult into ornament and crime, which is generating this envelope shape. And that's going into to control the VCA on Brent. So it has a built-in VCA as well. Now I could just as easily have taken the mod parameter and used it to control, you know, any other parameter here, let's say this. There's only one mod output, unfortunately, but you can assign one of three sources to it. Here, I've got it assigned to the mod strip, but you could also assign velocity or aftertouch to the mod output. Okay, let's dive into the details. I'll start with the arpeggiator, which will cycle through notes that you play, up to 32 notes at the same time. You need to hit play to get it going. And it will, of course, match the tempo and the time division. And there's also a hold function. So if we get this going, it has a few modes, up mode, down mode, up and down, where it repeats the edge nodes, Stranger Things mode, Then a random option. Then walk in pattern, which we'll get to in a bit. And order plays the keys in the order with which you press them. So let's talk about walk in pattern. Walk is sort of like a drunken walk across the notes. So these are my three notes. And walk will either walk back and forth, usually in a forward direction, but back and forward randomly, let's maybe press quite a few notes. So it's generally moving forward between the notes, but every now and then moving backwards. And then pattern is an interesting one. What pattern does is roll the dice every time you play a new set of notes and create a random pattern that includes those notes, but is a certain length long, a certain number of steps long. And you determine that by holding record and then pressing any number here on the left it will add up any numbers if you want to get to more than 16. So I could add up five and five to 10 and then add another, say 12 for 22 steps. And then if I hit play and say, press this pattern, it'll generate a 22 step pattern based on these notes. It's more practical, I think, in the lower pattern lengths. And yeah, every time you press a new chord, you get to audition another pattern. There's no way to save these patterns currently, which would have been nice. But I think this element of randomness can produce pretty interesting melodies. And if you find something you like, you can always go ahead and step sequence that manually currently. A few more important features about the arpeggiator. You can have it go up and down octaves by holding shift and octave plus. It can go either up or down. And it also has swing and gate controls. So shorter gate, again, based on the envelope shape, of course and swing controls. A major update to key step 37 is the 54% swing, as well as a few other options. 
So that's the arpeggiator. Let's move on and talk about the sequencer. Since the sequencer is polyphonic, we'll part ways with a modular system. I'll move to a piano sound on my computer. The key step 37 can store eight sequences. You select a sequence you want to record into, hit record, and then play either a single note or multiple notes per step and hit stop and play. You can append notes to a pattern by hitting shift and append. Or delete the last step. You can do that while a pattern's running. Until it's gone. Let's record another pattern. If record is on, you can record notes onto the sequence, and you can do that by either replacing notes, or if you hit shift and overdub, you can overdub notes onto an existing pattern. without replacing notes in the pattern. You can also set a pattern length just like we did for the arpeggiator pattern. So if this is my pattern, I can hit record and set a pattern length of say four steps. And you can do this in real time while a pattern is playing. So let's say I'll go back to 16 steps. And that's more than I recorded originally. I could overdub notes now as well, but let's say now we're down to eight steps, and this takes effect when I release the button. So now it's eight steps, and say, back to two, four. Really nice feature, I think, changing the pattern length dynamically. If you want to delete a pattern, just hit shift and the two octave notes, pattern's gone. You could set a length to a pattern before you record it say 16 steps. The problem, however, with recording over an empty pattern is that Key Step 37 doesn't have a built-in metronome, so you'd need an external drum machine or module synced over MIDI or over the sync output. Or if you have an old set of headphones, you can also plug them into the sync output. Voltage is pretty high here, so I wouldn't risk it with something you wanna take care of. So I could go ahead and connect the audio out of sample drum so that we can hear it. And then I've got clock sync out going out of the Key Step into sample drum. So as I hit play, let me just maybe create a new pattern here. Doesn't matter what. 18 step pattern. I could always race it by holding rest and tie all the way through, or just by hitting shift in these two buttons. Anyway, while I've got this playing, I could now play on top of this pattern. So an external metronome is a great way to help you keep time as you record over an empty sequence. Now, as you may have heard, the velocity I play with is recorded, but everything is still stuck on the grid. Unless I use swing, you don't have any micro timing options here. You always play on the grid. A few more neat features. You can transpose a sequence by selecting transpose mode, holding shift and transpose, or play on top of a sequence. So let's start with transpose. Any key will now transpose this pattern. octave down or anything in between and then keyboard play lets me play on top of the pattern and a really nice feature I could change the MIDI channel with which I play on top of a pattern so by default, the keyboard play function plays on the same channel as the main sequence that's playing. But if I hold shift and octave plus and then choose a different channel, and here I've got a synth on channel nine, I'm broadcasting now on, okay, that was a bit too much, on channel nine. So now I've got this synth on channel nine, the piano is being sent on MIDI channel one, and I have previously mapped the knobs to control different parameters of the synth, so I could use them here as well. I've got knob one and bank one to control the cutoff and knob two controlling resonance. Okay, that was the sequencer. Let's talk about chord mode. You can program your own chords just by holding the chord button and playing an interval, and then you can transpose that interval. 
up and down the keyboard. And you've got a few pre-programmed shapes that you can access in chord mode. And let me just reset this to somewhat of reasonable defaults. So you always determine how many notes you have in a chord using this button, up to 16 notes per chord. And this applies to custom chords as well. So if I program a short chord, simple major chord, and play that, I can add more notes to it, all adhering to the interval that I set, or use any one of the other programmed chords, user octaves, and this goes up to four octaves, fifths, sus chord, minor, minor seventh, ninth, and eleventh, and then major options, seventh, ninth, eleventh, I think that's it. And it will keep on again, adding notes up to a four octave span and up to 16 notes. If you activate velocity to notes, then these two work together. The harder you press, the more notes you get in a chord. So let me go up to 16 here. So if I press very softly, I'll only get a few notes. And then as I press harder, I'll get more. And then you, you determine the sensitivity of this option with this knob. And then finally, there's the strum feature. So it's bipolar. In the middle, it doesn't do anything. Let's turn the velocity down. And as you increase this, it'll start strumming notes up. So maybe add some more notes. And by default, this speed isn't related to the tempo of the project, but as you turn this clockwise, you'll start to see that there are a few options where it is related to the tempo. So it's your choice whether you want this to work with the tempo or independently of it. And this is bipolar, so going the other way, we'll strum downwards. Again, slower, non-tempo synced. Then you've got a few tempo synced options, including triplet and dotted options like you had on the way up. So a really nice feature. One final important thing to say about the chords. Let's maybe turn this into something more reasonable. Chords do work with the arpeggiator and sequencer, but only for uh, one note at a time. So you can't get a chord out of two notes. It'll just play one at a time, but this does work with the sequencer or with the arpeggiator. Okay, before we move on to the pros and cons, let's take a look at a few tips or ideas you may want to try with the Keystep 37. The first thing is you may not think of it as a drum sequencer, but since the sequencer is polyphonic, there's no reason why it shouldn't be able to sequence drums. For example, Black Box is a really nice sample player, but its sequencer is a bit of a hassle to use with the touchscreen, so you could use this as a simple sequencer for Black Box. And pretty much any other drum machine, when you hook up a keyboard to it or send MIDI signals to it, it will usually play different sounds based on the note that you play. So if I go into sequencer mode and pick any one of the patterns, hit record, I could sequence a simple basic beat, let's say, do this, and I can play polyphonically, right? Two drums at a time, let's finish a bar. And if I hit play, I've got a simple beat. I could overdub this. Remember, you wanna be in overdub mode, otherwise it will erase notes that are already on the beat. But yeah, while I have this recording, I could try, say, everything is quantized, so it should be pretty simple. And there's no need to sequence in real time. You can always slow it down. So 
So a little drum sequencer. Now the nice thing is that swing works here as well. And if you want to program ratchets, like I said, you always have to program on the grid, but you could always record a sequence with rests in between, then play it faster and have a higher resolution. So it would look something like this. I'd say program this and rest, and rest, and so maybe do another one, rest, rest. So that's my pattern. And I could play it faster. Then say add a ratchet. By the way, if you have a computer nearby, you could always use Arturia's MCC software. It has a built-in sequencer. You could sequence on a grid there and then transfer patterns over USB to the Keystep 37. So that's the Keystep 37 as a mini drum sequencer. Aside from that, it's also a great platform for generative experimentation, meaning that you can use it as a tool that develops and enhances ideas you play into it. So the first generative tool here is scales, in particular the user scales. Now you don't need to plug in a conventional scale by any means, so you can get as creative as you want, select any notes you want. Let's say go for uh, maybe this as a very limited scale. So these four notes, I could now play an arpeggiated pattern on top of that and you know who knows what can happen. So maybe hold this. Scales are applied as a filter to everything, so they apply to chords as well. If I go ahead and program this chord. And this, of course, pairs very nicely with the strum feature. Always record this into a DAW if you can. You never know what you can then later on pick up and develop onto a more fleshed out idea. I could then go ahead and change that scale on the fly. Limit it more. Or add notes to it. Just experiment with different ideas by adding and removing notes that are allowed to participate in the scale. Another interesting generative idea, I think, is what I played in the intro to this video. So the idea here is to start with a simple pattern and then using strum, add more notes to it. Now remember, strum can either be rate synced or if I slow this down considerably, not rate synced at all. So basically the gate length will determine how long a pattern is being strummed. The longer the gate, the more notes get strummed. And of course, different scales as well. Maybe add some more notes and a longer gate. This works both with obviously the factory scales as well as user scales here too. You can change the user scale around to experiment with different ideas. Some Sometimes not so great, but occasionally you'll stumble upon something nice. I don't know, I just think this is a fantastic generative compositional tool. Another interesting generative tool is the pattern arpeggiator mode. I already covered this, so I'll just repeat it very briefly in case you skipped around. So again, set a pattern length. I'll set it to six. I think that gives nice results. Play a chord. And if you get a pattern you like off the bat, great. You know, jot it down or record it into a DAW. If you don't like it, try again if you don't like it. Try again, try different lengths. So that's pattern mode in the arpeggiator as a way to come up with interesting melodies based on a specific set of notes. Another interesting generative idea you might want to try is clocking the key step with a 
Euclidean sequencer or really any other drum machine that can send triggers and use different rhythmic triggers to move the sequencer or arpeggiator forward rather than a regular clock. So I've got this cable going into the sync input of the key step and I'll plug it into here. This is a Euclidean sequencer, but like I said, you could use any drum machine potentially to send triggers into here. It should work nicely, assuming that drum machine can send out triggers. For this to work well, you need to set the clock to follow the sync input using the dip switches on the back of key step, as well as set the proper setting in MIDI control center based on what you're sending it. I'll be using the dot module here. It has three patterns, each up to 16 steps long. And if I get it going, I hit play here. If all the dots are full, I just get a simple pattern and I've got a simple single note sequence here. But if I change that to a different rhythmic interval, I could get some pretty interesting sequences. So let's get that going. Maybe do it with the arpeggiator and yeah, enter a pattern. This basically gives the arpeggiator a rhythm function you might find on other arpeggiators. And generatively speaking, is a nice way to explore different rhythms with your melodies. And then a final little performance trick, whether you're playing a drum beat or a melodic sequence, shorten the sequence for fills. So say, choose two steps. It'll become active when I release this. Or different length fills. Just a neat little trick to get some live variation with your patterns. Okay, let's talk about pros and cons. On the pros side, the original key step and now key step 37 are excellent for small hardware setups because of their connectivity options, built in arpeggiator and sequencer and overall ease of use. They're compact. They have both MIDI and CV controls with velocity sensitive keys with aftertouch. And I personally don't mind the MIDI keys at all. It's up to you whether you care about that or not. That said, they're still single track instruments as opposed to the four track Keystep Pro or eight track SL Mark III by Novation. So they're useful mainly for small dollless setups, less so for controlling multiple devices at once. In terms of a companion for a computer, even though Keystep 37 now has four knobs and four banks of those knobs to control CC parameters, if you're looking to control your DAW, there are more suitable keyboards that have either more knobs or pads, and more importantly, a direct DAW integration. Some controllers even with screens that show you parameter values. That said, because the Keystep 37 is such a great sketchpad, especially with the new generative style pattern, scale, and strum features, it would be nice if in the future there was some form of basic DAW integration, even though that's not really what a keyboard like this is for. It would be nice to be able to control, say, device parameters in Ableton with these knobs switching between banks potentially. Beyond that, there are pros and cons to strip-based pitch bend and mod wheel controls. Pros are that it's easier to perform vibrato using a touchpad like this rather than a controller. The cons are that you can't see the value of the mod strips. You may leave it at any point and not know where you left it. It would have been nice had there been maybe LEDs here to show you the position of the mod strip. Another disadvantage of these strip-based controls, I did find myself occasionally accidentally hitting these. So you do have to be mindful of that when you play the lower octave. A few more small complaints. The Keystep 37 only sends MIDI CCs, not high resolution NRPNs or MSB LSB pairs. It would be nice if that would be added in a future firmware update. Beyond that, what you record is always quantized to Keystep's grid. There's no way to shift notes off the grid other than swing, of course. And no automation is recorded, so you can't sequence pitch bends or mod wheel changes. So that's it for Keystep 37, a very welcome entry to the portable controller space. If you enjoyed the insights in this video, there are plenty more in my ever expanding book available to the people who support this channel on Patreon. Hit like if this was useful, ring the bell after subscribing to make sure you don't miss the next one. Thanks for watching.